<laughs> with some support, with the right support and a few good people, um, you can overcome a lot, right? And, you know, a good support network. So humanity supporting humanity, maybe that's a good way to phrase it. If you, if you, if you, I want to introduce Professor O'Connor, who's here as well, who is, who is also the, um, the, the person behind the whole uh, faculty institute, right? Uh, that, that, Hello, Professor. Uh, that Jesse had the privilege to review. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I'm really excited to to uh, to be here and have another chance to learn from Rob Robinson. So, thanks, Christine. Thank you very much. Very kind. Yeah. I, I also got to say, I, I I actually met Rob two weeks ago, personally for the first time, in person, which is a, which was. We have communicated a lot over electronic means over a few years, but we actually physically were together a couple of weeks ago. It was pretty cool. <laughs> yes. I guess maybe we could get started pretty soon here. But um, in the next few minutes until 2.10, if members and officers who haven't signed in yet or filled out the attendance form, if they could do that, um, let's just get that out of the way first and then we can move on to our presentation, our speaker. How's attendance looking, Nina? <laughs> People filling out the form. Cool. Someone's All actually right. in the middle of doing it. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Um, I'll wait for another minute or so. Um, and then I'll introduce Rob Robinson, speaker today, um, and let him take it away. All right, why wait? <laughs> um, you can always sign, <laughs> fill in the form some of the, um, at the end of the meeting too. Um, there's a link in the chat, so in case anyone needs to fill out attendance, Nina sent out a link to a Google form and all you have to do is check that link out. Anyway, so Rob Robinson was a co-founder and member of the leadership committee of the Take Back the Land Movement and is currently a staff volunteer at Partners for Dignity and Rights, formerly known as NESRI, N-E-S-R-I. After losing his job in 2001, he spent two years homeless on the streets of Miami and 10 months in New York City and, and 10 months in a New York City shelter. 
He eventually overcame homelessness and has been in the housing movement based in New York City since 2007. He worked with social movements around the world, including the movement of people affected by dams from Brazil, MAV, the Landless Workers Movement in Brazil, MSC, Avalali, base, sorry if I but, uh, butcher this, Mujondolo. Don't worry about it, it's a tough word. Avishali, base, Mujondolo. Mujondolo in South Africa, uh, the Shack Dwellers Movement, and the platform of people affected by mortgages in Spain, the PAH. Rob is the USA-Canada coordinator of International Alliance of Inhabitants, an alliance of 12,000 members worldwide, which supports a zero evictions platform. In the US, he works with communities on several social issues, including poverty and debt, police violence against the poor, gentrification, and access to broadband. He has lectured at several US law, uh, law school human rights institutes, including University of Miami, Northeastern University of Massachusetts, University of California at Berkeley, and Harvard University. He is a regular guest lecturer at the New School and the City University of New York Graduate Center. At the New School, he also mentors students and supports their thesis projects in an agricultural master's degree program called Design in Urban Ecology. Um, like I said before, as you as you guys see, Rob is a super charming, enthusiastic, really energetic personality with tons of insight and great just great perspective on on homelessness and poverty as an issue throughout the U.S. Um, so without further ado, I'll let you guys hear yes, from him himself. Thank <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction. Um, much appreciation to Professor Farias, who I'm building a relationship with her and her family, which is unique and great to see William again. Um, Professor Farias introduced us and connected us some time ago, and we had a great conversation, and hopefully it was just the start of many more to come. But it is an honor for me to be in front of you today to share a little bit of a personal story and what I like to refer to as a personal transformation that I hope could extend beyond me. And what do I mean by that? So we're all taught certain things from the time we come out of the womb and you know, we go to school, we learn certain things, but my experience in the second part of my life told me after coming out of that New York City shelter that I needed to do a brain dump and learn the world all over again because it wasn't as it was presented to me. Um, a lot of things happened along the way and those two and a half years on the streets of Miami and 10 months in the New York City homeless shelter gave me space to think and, and sort of recalibrate my brain. And um, I, man, it's led to an interesting afterlife or second life, so to speak. So quick little family background. Um, I was one of six children. Uh, my parents, my parents are both from the South. Dad was from Florida, mom was from South Carolina, working class family. I was born in Brooklyn. My family moved to Nassau County, to Freeport, a South Shore community on, on, in Nassau County, along the water in 1962. And I look back and laugh now because all of our relatives thought we were rich because, you know, we got a house out on Long Island way back in the 60s. But that was probably the first understanding for me that there was a such thing as predatory lending and discrimination in housing. So I remember very my dad coming home angry one day after he and my mom went out to Long Island to look at the house that they wanted to buy. But after making the trip all the way out there, they were told that there was already a down payment and the buyer was probably going to buy the house. My dad kind of didn't believe the real estate agent and asked one of his white co-workers to inquire about the house. And he took a trip out there about two weeks later, the real estate agent was asking him for a down payment if he was interested. And there began a little bit of an understanding as I look back at history of discrimination in housing. I think the second part of it for me was as a kid, I didn't see my dad a lot because he was working 16 to 18 hours a day in the restaurant business, trying to pay off a predatory loan that he got to buy that house. 
So it, it, as we fast forward to today, many of us have been raised and led to believe that home ownership is the way to wealth. I would argue that it is the way to perpetual debt, that conditions have not have changed over 50, 60 years. Yes, when my parents bought that house in the 1960s, I don't know about wealth, but it was a way possibly to get some security, I like to refer to it as, right? We've all heard stories about our parents buying a house and using that house to send kids to college and all that. I call that security. I wouldn't call that wealth. It gives you a little uh, stability of a platform, but when you start to pay taxes, like my brother does now for the house that I grew up in, 11 Is it just me or did Rob scream? I was gonna ask for everyone else? that I froze. For a house okay. where the mortgage is paid off each now. It looks great, right? The Jones has got a new car, so your family has to get a new car. I think Rob Rob's having some connectivity issues, but he he's he keeps he's talking. Mm -hmm. Rob? Are you, you guys not hearing me? We, we lost you a little bit, so you may want to repeat a little bit of what you said. Yeah, so I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm really laying out what perpetual debt looks like or, or seems like, you know, um, we get caught up in, can you guys hear me now? Are you hearing me? Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay. Um, I, I think sometimes we misunderstand what wealth really is, right? And if we opened up our eyes and took a clear look, we realize that we're, we're indebted and we're constantly in debt. But that's the kind of society that we believe in, that we grew into and we buy into things. David Harvey is, always explains it as our salvation for material things. And for me, part of the, trans, the transformation after coming out of homeless, that was part of it. I. I once won an award at ADP for the best dressed guy at ADP. And just so I went homeless after working for ADP, but let me just back up a little bit. So ADP is a payroll company, automatic data processing. Uh, they had an office in Melville, Long Island. I lived in Manhattan on 109th Street at the first time. So I used to do a reverse commute for 13 years. I do a reverse commute going out to Long Island to work, come back home, get off the train at Penn Station, Guess what, across the street is Macy's. Go walk through Macy's before I get on my bus ride uptown and maybe buy a new suit. I eventually won an award at Macy's for the best dressed guy at ADP. I bought into that. So every day when I come back through Penn Station, let me walk through Macy's. Maybe I need a new shirt, new tie. I, I sort of look at that with disdain now and I'm like, how we get caught up in things. Why do you have to have a new suit every night? This is because we get caught up in a society that salivates over material things and we compete with one another. That's the thing that I've learned through this transformation. We're in constant competition and we buy into that. Doesn't appeal to me. So a little bit of the history, just to take you back a step. I grew up the working class family, raised on Long Island. Um, if you got to see me physically, I have a little bit of a disability. I've had three hip replacements, need a fourth. I broke my hip in high school or fractured my hip every year of high school, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, and still went to the University of Maryland on a college scholarship to play football and broke and fractured my pelvis um, at the University of Maryland, and I couldn't play football anymore. Um, one story for the folks who were... Uh, interested in football. My one year at Maryland, I played on, in a defensive backfield with uh, a, a cowboy who is a 10-time All-Pro and in the Hall of Fame. Uh, I won't mention the name, but he was from the Tennessee Mountains, and he used to laugh at me all the time because when we had a break, I wouldn't go back to the Smoky Mountains with him to wrestle bears so we could get stronger. 
Uh, just, I thought that would be a funny story to add into this, but that's that's the mentality, right? Like, I'm going to go to, okay, city boy, you go wherever you go. I'm going back to get strong for the team. But, you know, thank God I, I was able to get an education. One of the things my dad uh, made clear to Jerry Claiborne, who was a coach when he came for the recruiting is, if he gets hurt, I want to make sure he has a full year, four year scholarship, right? He should get educated. It's not just about playing football. My dad wasn't educated. Uh, my mom wasn't very well educated. Dad finished eighth grade. My mom finished 10th grade. I was the first one in the family to finish uh, high school and college and was always looked upon as person who could do the problem solving in the family. Right. So anytime there was an issue in the family, my dad would say, go see your brother. He's the smart one. So I worked for ADP. I worked my way up from taking payrolls over the phone uh, from little mom and pop operations to becoming a project manager, overseeing a piece of software that ADP said would move it into the new millennium. It's called ADP Total Source, a call center piece of software. I became the most proficient user. And in March 2001, ADP came to me and asked me to move to Miami to beta test this new piece of software. Um, I was African-American as I still am, <laughs> pretty funny, uh, but very few African-Americans at ADP were in high level positions at that time. 60,000 employees worldwide, it's a Fortune 500 company, but they came to me to ask me to take on this position. So a lot of sense, I felt, you know, proud, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna move to Miami, very little notice, two weeks notice. I moved to Miami in March, 2001. Um, ADP gave me a $10,000 relocation fee, put me up in a hotel for three months, gave me a vehicle to drive. And in the fourth month, I was called into the general manager's office of ADP Total Source in Miami and told there's no more money in the position, in the company for your position, we're gonna have to let you go. 13 years of hard work, just disposed of like trash that quickly, right? But I hadn't done any homework on Miami when I moved down there. That was in 2001. It was just after the Mariel boat lift. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. There was a mass exodus from Cuba and Haiti and people were coming into Miami and over oversaturating the workers market. Um, I couldn't find work after I got laid off. I had... Uh, unemployment for about a year, severance pay for about a year, that ran out. I started to tap into 401k, uh, that ran out. And before you know it, I ended up on the streets of Miami, spent two and a half years on the streets of Miami, three hurricanes, um, one year in Miami, and there were Hurricane Rita and Katrina were part of that. Hurricane Katrina, that is well-documented. I spent in a school bus during that storm praying for the better part of 12 hours. It, that school bus sat in the middle of a parking lot that advertised a, a conditional driver's license school in the back. I had nowhere else to go. I just stayed in that school bus and, and prayed for the better part of 12 hours while the wind and the rain rocked that bus uncontrollably. At some point I fell asleep. I heard a bunch of glass cracking and I wake up and look out of the window and some young folks were robbing a radio shack. They busted the front window and were looting a radio shack. All I did was look up to the sky and say, I survived, thank God, right? Um, found my way back to New York a couple of months later. And that's, I got to Port Authority. I was uh, sent back on a bus by some outreach workers in Miami, sent back to New York on a bus, two and a half day bus trip. If you've ever taken Greyhound, you know, lay over here, lay over there. It was, it wore me out, but two and a half days. So I get to Port Authority in New York and the last transfer was to go from Port Authority to go out to Hempstead, Long Island, which was closest to Freeport, Long Island. I hadn't told my family that I was homeless the whole two and a half years, because as I told you earlier, when it came to problems, they were always told, go see your brother. He's the smart one, he'll figure it out. And I said, I have to figure this out. I get to Port Authority, I go in to use the bathroom, and I can see I'm un, a little bit unkempt, unshaven. And I asked somebody in Port Authority where I could go to get cleaned up. They pointed to a shelter across the street. I went in there, came out 10 months later as an organizer and wanting to change the world, a better understanding of what gentrification is and how it negatively affects people. 
most of the people that during that 10 months that I was in the shelter would spend their time staring at the walls. And for various reasons, I'm not picking on them. I just couldn't do that. I had to make my time useful. And those 10 months I spent at the 40th Street Library, if you're familiar with it, on Fifth Avenue and 40th Street, studying gentrification and understanding what it was, right? From what I'd seen in Miami with the luxury towers going up and hearing that same term here in New York, I said, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. how are you building housing for wealthy people when you see poor people sleeping on the subway, sleeping in the streets? And it sort of, it energized me. I got an opportunity to join a group called Picture the Homeless, uh, who was organizing homeless people. And that gave me an opportunity to speak at a housing conference that I would argue today forever changed my life and is probably is what has put me in the seat in front of you. This was at Columbia University and um, it was February, 2008. Um, I was on a panel talking about housing struggles in New York and to my immediate right, was one, there were three speakers other than me. To my immediate right was Dr. Peter Marcuse, Professor Emeritus from Columbia University, urban planner and a lawyer and son of Herbert Marcuse. If you look up those names, you'll find out those are two fascinating names. Um, to uh, Peter's right was Brenda Stokely. Brenda Stokely was a former uh, union organizer with DC 37, the Municipal Workers Union in New York. And to her right was a gentleman by the name of Ed Ott. Ed Ott was at that time, the director of the Central Labor Council in New York, which is an umbrella over all the unions. He is now a distinguished professor of labor studies at the Murphy Center, which is part of the CUNY system. Um, and I was sweating bullets, man. I'd never spoken publicly about housing and you know affordable housing. I just knew you know, it was an issue, right? Um, but I came up with this theory as I went through what I went through and saw what other people were going through. And that theory is this, that gentrification leads to displacement, which leads to homelessness, which leads to criminalization. And I said that partway through my speech and there was a gentleman in the audience by the name of Neil Smith, a distinguished professor of anthropology and geography from the CUNY Grad Center. And Neil stood up and interrupted our talk and said, say that again. And I repeated it, gentrification leads to displacement, which leads to homeless, uh, homelessness, which leads to criminalization. And Neil said to me, uh, after the conference, I wanna, I, I'm, I'm gonna approach you. I wanna know how you came upon that theory. Then he challenged me um, to come out and meet him for lunch. He wanted to talk to me more. And over lunch, Neil told me he wanted me to come up and lecture his graduate students. And right away, I froze in place and said, I can't lecture graduate students. Neil was teaching PhD students at the grad center. And he just very, in a stern and angry sort of way, looked at me and said, you taught me, you're gonna come up and teach my students. I demand you come up to the grad center. <laughs> so I, about a month later, I show up at the grad center didn't prepare any reading. Um, if you know, I'm sure you guys all know, and Professor O'Connor and Professor Farias always have you reading stuff and reading materials. So I knew reading was a center part of any lecture you're gonna get, but I didn't prepare any readings. So I sat there very sheepishly as Neil introduced me, much the way Jesse did, right? And I finally look at Neil and I say, well, I didn't prepare anything for this lecture. And Neil just looked back at me and says, you didn't need to prepare. Make the statement that you made at the conference where I heard you and guarantee that's gonna cause an enrich, an enlightening conversation in this room like you probably never experienced. And sure enough, I made that statement and those students uh, asked me a bunch of questions. We had a back and forth dialogue. And today, many of those students are teaching around the country. So that list that Jesse reeled off, many of those students are teaching at those universities and constantly bring me in to speak to their classes. So it's an ongoing thing. And Neil always believed that learning was a reciprocal process. He said the community comes into the academy, the academy goes into the community, and it's a wheel that keeps turning and regenerating knowledge. It's shared, right? There's a lot, he, he always said to me, 
you have a lived experience that I never had. So you have a lot to teach and there are others like you. So your job is to go out and encourage the others like you to come into the academy and, and, and teach us and inform us. And my job is to inform the students that are in the academy to go out in the community and learn from people like you. So it's, it's a, a message and a, I think it's a process that I love to see continue and I've been doing that. So how do you do that, right? I do it, I've done it in many ways. When I came out of shelter, I used to bang the table and say, we need affordable housing, right? You have to build affordable housing. Wages aren't rising as fast as rents, right? So people are always gonna be behind the eight ball. They can't afford housing. But I learned something along the way and it came because I, I met some Brazilian folks. And I learned that you'll never control housing until you control the land underneath it. There is a direct correlation. Any of you that are familiar with development in New York, air rights are for sale in Manhattan, especially around where your school exists. Um, I work not far from where your school exists. And you can go straight up, right, for millions of dollars. Air rights are selling for 500, about $585 a square foot right now. That means if you had what you don't see or you see very few of in New York, one-story gas stations, one-story parking lots, there used to be a lot of them. They're gone, right? And one, the gas station I always remember, I don't know how familiar you guys are with Manhattan, 10th Avenue between 45th Street and 46th was a huge gas, uh, Hess gas station that had about a dozen bays, right? A dozen islands of pumps. That gas station was sold for $47 million. And now there's a 14 story office building on top of it with a target on the bottom floor, which is probably bringing in the big part of the rent, but the rest of it is being rented out as office space. Right around the corner from where I am, so I'm in the Office of Partners for Dignity and Rights in the Financial District on John Street, not far, a block away from the South Street Seaport. There used to be a parking garage that was 10 stories high, and the tourists would come off the South Street Seaport and watch the elevators take the cars up and put them in parking spaces and people would stand there mesmerized, right? Just like it was a tourist attraction, right? To see cars being parked. Strange, but people used to stand there. A developer came along to that uh, parking lot owner and offered him $73 million for his parking garage. And the guy asked, what do I sign? And right now there's a 54 story condominium building that sits up there with studio started at $1.2 million, right? You know, it's 54 stories high. So you have the possibility to go up. Development is to know Tish James, when she was a council member, once said, development is to New York as oil is to Texas. So it is an uphill battle as we fight for that. But I wanna take a quick step back um, and take you around the world a little bit. I said, you'll never control housing until you control the land. Brazil's constitution says land has to serve a social purpose. It has to be either be growing food or housing people. It's in their constitution. Unlike the constitution that we have written in 400 years of good old boys language, which was only there to serve wealthier folks, right? A small selected group of folks. But as we look at these modern constitutions around the world, human rights values and principles are embedded in those constitutions. That's why I got to know Abishali in South Africa because when post-apartheid South Africa and the new constitution came in 1996, the human right to a home is guaranteed in that constitution. Not always realized, but it is in that constitution and that makes the fight a little bit easier. But talking about that and talking about housing and land, um, I used to bang the table as I started to learn and I started to educate myself and saying we have to decommodify land and decommodify housing. It doesn't work for us um, as a commodity. And it's funny how you can use the medium of a computer and social, uh, social media to get a story out. Some folks in Brazil saw me a couple of times on YouTube having a conversation just like we're having now and making a point. So they reached out to a, uh, an organization based in New York that does food sovereignty work called Why Hunger. Why Hunger's, uh, their main office is on 35th Street and 8th Avenue. 
And there's a Brazilian that at one time that was the international organizer for Why Hunger by the name of Salo Arahu. So they call Salo up one day and say, Salo, do you know this guy? We always see him on YouTube talking about land and the relationship to land has to change. And Salo laughs and goes, Rob? Yeah, everybody knows Rob. Hold on. We were using Skype at the time. And he brings me in on Skype. And they were stunned to like see me on the media on this video, right? And they invited me to Brazil uh, to come down for their national encounter in 2013. And the rest is, as they say, is history. I've been there every year since. I've been there in commemorations of dams breaking. That's why I have this relationship with the movement of people affected by dams. They're building hydroelectric dams in Brazil in the name of cheaper electricity and energy, but it is being sold off outside of Brazil. So the people who sacrifice their land, their livelihood, aren't benefiting from it. There's a certain small group of people that are benefiting from that energy of production. And they started to understand, maybe they, they started to build dams. You once were a farmer and they're gonna build a dam through your community. So they move you from one side of the Dose River in Minas Gerais to the other. When you were on one side, you had fertile land and your family were farmers. Now all of a sudden, and you had title. Now you move to the other side of the river because the dam comes through. The land is no longer fertile. You don't have title. So their lives were put into a disruptive phase. And they started building, you know, strength and power by working internationally with groups to support their struggle. Similarly to Abishali, the, the name that Jesse struggled with a little bit, Abishali was promised homes when the new constitution took place and the ANC took over as the government in South Africa and Nelson Mandela, we're going to give all the poor people homes. Well, you know, hard workers and poor people were still traveling to and from uh, Durban, South Africa and places like Joburg, but they were living on the outskirts, but working for wealthy people in the center of town. But as they traveled to and from each day, two hours, vacant swaths of land are sitting there open. Those folks started to have an idea. Why are we traveling so far if that land is available right there? Why don't we move there? They started taking over that land, building shacks, hence the name the shack dwellers, and the municipality started tearing them down and saying, you have no right to this land, you know, much like our constitution is based on, you know, a small group of people owning the land. They push back, push back. And for me, I got, I was called attention to this group. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Union Theological Seminary in Manhattan, it's up near Columbia University. They were showing a film called Dear Mandela, and it was about the struggle of Abishali. But what struck me in that film was a 14-year-old that I got to meet later on named Mazwi, pounding his chest and saying, I have the human right to a home. It's right here, and he has a copy of their constitution. And that image to me was so powerful, this little 14-year-old kid understanding their constitution and fighting for his people. And I said, that's the least that I could do. I was so inspired, but I was, I was inspired by seeing that, but I was overjoyed when I got to meet Mazwi in Brazil at the World Urban Forum in 2010. And we sat, we broke bread together and picked on each other one after one. I, I ordered a can of Coca-Cola at a dinner and they basically ripped me a new you know what, because I was, <laughs> yeah, I had purchased this product. But then they got to come here, right? And when they got to come here, Mazwi and, and Mankalo, two of the young warriors from that group, they wanted me to take them out to buy iPhones. And I said, you know what? I feel the same way about Apple products that you do about Coca-Cola. So I, there will be no shopping for iPhones with me. You're going to have to work somebody else, right? But, you know, we built a friendship and a comradeship um, together. And I've been working with that group and working with a professor, um, Professor O'Connor and Farias. I don't know if you know this name, Marie Hooksmeyer. Um, you probably know the name Patrick Bond. Uh, both of them work closely with this group. Um, they also work with the legal agency called SERI, S-E-R-I, the Socioeconomics Rights Initiative. And SERI has a long-standing relationship with 
what we used to call the community development project of the Urban Justice Center here in New York. So um, I got to meet Stuart. Um, one day I will get a copy of the film and get it to Professor Farias for you guys to view. I have copies, it's stored somewhere. I have all these movement films. I, it's in storage, but I'll have to find it. But I think it's a great inspirational film. But that opened the door for me to understand struggle internationally and understand um, that we're not the only ones going through this. And in many cases, while we fight poverty in this country, which has never been investigated or never looked at really, that's our structural problem is poverty, right? It exists in a certain way. So a certain amount of people have the wealth and a certain group of people are cast aside. And I think that's our fundamental problem. It's never been addressed. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X both took bullets because they were addressing poverty and human rights near the end of their lives, right? They gave their lives fighting for that struggle and it still exists today, right? We have been very dismissive of human rights in this country. We, you know, it's, it's something foreign, right? We're this great democracy. We don't have human rights violations. So I question you, if we're a great democracy, why was it law? And I, I have this challenge, civil rights, civil law versus human law, human rights law, right? It was once law in this country because of the color of my skin that I couldn't urinate in certain bathrooms, but I need to relieve myself, otherwise I'm gonna die, right? But because your, your skin is dark, you have to go somewhere else. You have to find a bathroom somewhere else. That was written in our law, right? This great democracy. I would argue that there's a problem in Michigan. Um, you all may know some of the story of water troubles in Michigan, particularly Flint, but it also happened in Detroit. Detroit, once called the Paris of the US, right? Built on the back of automobile manufacturing. At one time, Ford had 600,000 employees in Michigan. They don't have 60,000. They don't have 6,000 in all of North America now today because they've shipped that out to abused labor in other places, right? Um, but Detroit started to go into a downward spiral, right? People couldn't find work. Population was 2.1 million in 86. It is now 750,000. Only one supermarket for those 750,000 people. Right, Detroit is struggling. The Model T factory, which America loves to promote, the Model T, the first car, is a shell of itself, a burnt out building with broken windows sitting in the middle of Highland Park. Ford, you couldn't invest in a museum. Why? Because it's in the middle of an African-American neighborhood. So you pulled all your money out. You have no use for those people anymore. Problem, Historic, historical problem continues to this day. That building in Highland Park just sits there empty. It is, I, every time I go to Detroit, I get angry when I look at that building. Come on, Ford, you couldn't invest in that building. You know, the struggle that went down in that building, there were labor struggles in that building, but there's a lack of investment because they're done with their neighborhood. Got all you could out of, got all the profit we could out of Detroit, see ya. You know, let's go to Dearborn now. Um, but the city went into a bankruptcy, right? And you know, this great democracy that we have allows Michigan's governor to appoint an emergency manager to thereby strip away the power of the people you voted for to represent you in government and make decisions on behalf of, of the city. And in, in Detroit in 2014, that emergency manager who was being paid $1,000 an hour by the bankrupt city decided that uh, if you don't, if you can't pay your water bill, you don't get any water. So if you're $250 in arrears or two months behind in your bills, you're not going to get any. Well, people need water to survive. It's a human, it, it's part of humanity, right? You need water to survive, but you can't have any because you can't pay. But Nestle's can go fill up all the bottles that they want and sell to you for a dollar. Long before many of you were born, if somebody approached us, Maybe even Professor Farias, I don't know if you remember this time, Professor O'Connor, somebody approached you and asked you for a dollar for a bottle of water. There used to be a, a commercial one. How about a nice Hawaiian punch? You probably punch the person right in the face if they ask for a dollar for a bottle. Now we just gladly hand over a dollar for a bottle of water. It's a natural, it's a natural element. 
who who says Nestle's has the right to sell it to me, right? Um, so I, I think there's that issue, right? So we stripped away the power of the people you voted for to represent me. Doesn't sound like a democracy to me, right? And then in Flint, you had a similar situation, except to make up for the bankruptcy, that emergency manager decided he was going to switch the water source, right? And feed people less expensive water. Poison, but less expensive, right? And you know what GM said? We're getting all kinds of reports that this is rusting the parts of our cars. We want to switch the water source. Oh, big corporate power. Okay, we'll put you back to the Detroit River, but we're going to continue to feed the people the poison water. This democracy has a lot of faults, folks. <laughs> it is not. It is not what it is built to be, or what we've told people that we represent. And I think, for me, my same comrades from Brazil. When they came here in 2016, I spent a week in Detroit and Flint with them. And one of the biggest terms they've always come out with, contradictions, Rob, contradictions. So what we're fed in the other side of the world about this great democracy is contradicted from what I just saw and what I visited over the last week, right? Brazilians from outside of the country came in, heard from the people, saw for themselves. And they concluded there's a lot of contradictions in the message that we send out to the rest of the world. <coughs> I want to leave some time for you guys to ask me some questions. I know Jesse made it clear that he wanted to end at three. Um, I'll just quickly, uh, Jesse <coughs> talked about the work of Take Back the Land. That was an answer to the foreclosure crisis of 2008. So what we found is banks like Bank of America were incentivized to foreclose and evict people um, in record numbers because, uh, just a quick example, if you buy a house in New York, you have to buy an insurance policy that's guaranteeing that you're going to pay off the mortgage. But if you fall behind and fall into foreclosure, um, I can evict you for non-payment. I'm going to get paid off by the insurance policy, and I still have the house to put back on the market. Corporations just have crazy power. But guess what, folks? Obama, a black president, said you can fail, but Bank of America can't fail. So I'm going to take your tax money and give it to Bank of America, Citibank, and they're going to evict you in record numbers and foreclose on you in the record numbers. More contradictions, right? It was a problem for us, particularly black folks who felt the brunt of it. So we came up with a novel idea. Take back the land said, we're gonna put homeless people in peopleless homes, homes where people were foreclosed and evicted by a bank or a government agency. We broke in them, moved the families back in there and defended their rights to stay in there using international human rights laws and mechanisms. And to this day, our biggest victory was in Rochester, New York, from a woman by the name of Catherine Lennon, who was evicted in March, 2011, we moved her back in Mother's Day of 2011, and she's been in that house ever since because we went into court and we wrestled with Bank of America. After postponing the court appearances six times, they finally asked us what we wanted, and we said we want the house. And the reason why we were able to get that house so easy is Bank of America at one point took over the mortgage portfolio of Countrywide, which was another lending institution. When you sign a mortgage, a bank executive is supposed to sign a document. But when Countrywide sold to Bank of America, Bank of America hired people for $10 an hour to sit in the bank room and sign the bank president's name. And we got wind of that and we exposed it. And they realized that they went in deep doo-doo here, right? So what is it you want? We want the house. When Catherine was evicted, they wanted $50,000 cash. We signed for a dollar to get the house in November of uh, 2014. But in September of 2014, I was up at the University of Toronto saying, well, we're going to get this victory, folks. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. And all of a sudden, we did. And that, that is one of the proudest moments in this work for me. But we know we push back on the system. Poor Black folks without a lot of power push back on a very powerful system in one. So it can happen. But as, as Professor Faria said in the beginning, it might take a revolution for us to change the whole system. But this system of capitalism just does not work for all of us. So I want to save the last few minutes to see if we have any questions, conversations. You guys are going to get in challenges. I know sometimes people think I'm zany, 
right? But uh, especially when I say home ownership is not the way to wealth, right? It is a narrative that we've absorbed. But if we absorb all these narratives, the narratives would say that you're homeless because you don't want to work. You're homeless because you don't have an education. You're homeless because you have a chemical addiction. You're homeless because you have mental illness. I've worked since I was nine years old with my dad in the restaurant business. I have a college degree from the University of Maryland. Never diagnosed with mental illness. Don't have a chemical addiction. F the narratives, right? I'm going to write a new narrative. And that's been my mission ever since I came out of homelessness. So I'll stop there and allow you guys to, to ask questions. Thank you. Questions. So come on, somebody spot. William, I might put you on the spot because I <laughs> I saw you uh, acknowledging a lot. So this I, is an I, opportunity. I, I was unmuting. I was unmuting. Um, one of the reasons, one of the reasons why um, gentrification, homelessness, um, and social justice attached to economic justice in general um, happens in New York City. You know, um, these 59 communities is because a lot of people don't under really understand how these things are defined. So New York City mm -hmm. has a mass amount of low income housing and lotteries go out at least two or three times a day, which means that if you put a little effort in and work really, really hard, you should be able to get a nice piece of something and never have to worry about homelessness. But then when you look at the fine details on what qualifies as low income housing in comparison to the people who are available for it, this seems to be a really, really big problem there. Can you tell us how low income housing and affordable housing is defined in New York City? Absolutely. So what there's a calculation that is used called area median income. It is a geographical piece of the city, the five boroughs of New York City. Nassau, Suffolk, to wealthier counties to the east, and Putnam County, a non-contiguous county to the north of New York. And when you do the math, it says that the area median income of New York City for a family of four is $110,000. Now a developer comes along and he wants to build what we call 80-20. What William is referring to is a lot of times you'll hear housing organizers call it 80-20 housing, which means that developer got a break from the city and he committed to building a structure where 80% of those units are market rate, 20% are held for fixed or low income folks, right? So a developer comes along and he's got his eyes on East New York, Brooklyn, right? And he's gonna, you know, this is, this is ground zero right now. South Bronx and East New York, Brooklyn. I'm gonna put up this great uh, building in East New York, right? And I'm gonna make 20% of the units affordable for anybody who is 60% below area median income. 60% of 100,000, close to 40,000, 110,000, about 40,000 dollars, right? I would argue that the true area median income is somewhere in East New York around $30,000. So you're excluding the people you claim to be including. Vito Lopez, longtime state assemblyman and used to run Ridgewood Bushwick Senior Housing when I was with Picture the Homeless, this was something that enraged me when I was studying gentrification once challenged me at the Black, Latino, and Asian caucus in front of all the city council members. He thought he was going to throw this homeless guy under a bus. And he asked me, okay, if you say it's problematic, how would you fix it? And I said, use zip code. Excuse my language, folks, but the entire fucking country is mapped by zip code. When you hone in on East New York, Brooklyn, you're really going to get the area, area median income of East New York, Brooklyn. You're not going to include Nassau, Suffolk, those two wealthier counties to the east, or Putnam County, the wealthier county. And he was totally shut down, quiet as can be. Tish James was a council member at that point. And she had invited a picture to home. She's kicking me under the table. I never saw him with his lips shut down like that. I'm like, Tish, stop kicking me. <laughs> but if, if you know, if so, it's about political will, right? It's if that's what it really is. The entire it's not that difficult. The entire country is mapped out by zip code. So when you hone hone in on on South Bronx, you're gonna get the South Bronx, right? Why are you inflating with these phony numbers? 
because it's ideally, you know, development in New York has always been in bed with elected officials. It's problematic. I always use the example, and again, I want to see if there's another question. With the rezonings, uh, one of the earliest rezonings that I studied was Flatbush Avenue in downtown Brooklyn. The third busiest shopping center in New York State, fifth busiest in the country. What the fuck are you going to gain by rezoning that and bringing in different color faces? You just don't like the sneaker stores? Say that, right? If that's the problem, but it's, it's bringing, it's generating money, right? The business people are happy, but we had to rezone it. Only two people voted against it. Tony Avella, who was a council member in Bayside, Queens, and Charles Barron from East New York, Brooklyn, were the only two that said, this doesn't work for the city, but the rest of the city council voted for it, including the council member whose district it was. Well, I won't say anything, you can look that up, but that's, that's the problem. Our city council is constantly in bed with development. Other questions? Steven, I hope that answers your question. It does, it does. Steven um, has a question, he put it in the chat. Okay. Maybe Steven? Steven can maybe Steven can unmute and ask yeah. the question. Yeah. Come on, Steven, ask out loud. This is a this is a friendly space. Sure. Uh, my question was if home ownership wasn't the way to wealth, then what is? Probably in this country at this time, there's there's no wealth to be had unless it's passed down through family and generations, right? Um it, you're gonna work your ass off, right? <laughs> to just to just make ends meet. Right for some of us, the people that are enjoying wealth have family wealth. It's it's been passed on through generations, but you're not gonna, you know, you might get lucky and get a good stable life if you have money to invest. I don't know if any of you do. You can take some risk and invest, but only the wealthy are gonna get wealthier, Stephen. It, it's 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 not a way. It's mythical. It's a myth. It's a story. But you know what we do is we get debt. And we think we have money because we didn't pay off those bills. If we paid off all the debt that we had, we'd be po asses. <laughs> so let's be real, you know. And I think you know we have to we have to really think about it. We can get some security and some stability in life, you know, as we get better jobs and better employment and better situations. But you won't get wealthy in this country unless it's passed down to you through family. Interesting. Thank you very much. Sure. Other questions, thoughts? A couple of statistical things for you guys, as you know, I know you're in economics. New York City spends about $1.5 billion through the Department of Homeless Services to temporarily put people in shelters. Does that make sense? Couldn't you take 1.5 billion and find permanent places for people to stay? Maybe last shelter year. industrial complex just keeps growing and growing and growing and building more shelters run by not for profit organizations. Somebody's profiting because every time I say stop the shelter system, boy, I get attacked. <laughs> you know, don't mess with my money, Rob. You know? <laughs> don't mess with my pocket. Yeah. You know? So I think these are things to think about and, and look at government expenditures, where our money goes, how our tax money is being used. Um, as, as young folks, as I said earlier, you guys are the voices of the future, man. Um, all your professors, Professor O'Connor, Professor Farias, and myself, all we could do is tell you our lived experience and what has happened over a period of time. You guys got to connect the dots and take the tools that we leave behind and go out there to make change. And change is what's needed, right? As I speak to law schools, when we were all coming up, we were told you go to law school, you get a master's degree, you're gonna make a six figure salary, you're gonna get wealthy and get married, everything's gonna be great. You know what the law school children tell me now? I'm about to graduate, Robin, I'm looking at $200,000 worth of loan repayments. And every time I send out my resume, I'm only offered a 50 to $60,000 a year job. Mythical <laughs> storytelling time, right? Things change over a period of time. So we have to look at the world through a realistic lens, not this imaginary lens that everybody keeps feeding us and these, these imaginary narratives. We need to peel back the onion and really look closely and understand those conditions that we're existing in in the world today. So I will leave you, Jesse, I will turn it back over to you. I, I just thank you for the opportunity. Um, Professors like O'Connor and, and Farias, they, they, were, they were few and far between, right? To find progress, professors who understand the engagement and the connection with community is special. 
Um, I hope you guys can run across this again. It doesn't have to be me. You should have another professor doing the same thing. And if not, push your professor in that direction. Um, a professor once told me at Columbia University Law School, Marisa Kaufman, Rob, if if the student if the students appreciate what you're saying, they're going to come in here and drive me crazy till I bring you into the class. So keep pushing the students in the right direction, and eventually I'll open up the halls and bring you in and others like you to have conversations and share your stories and your views of the world. Right? Every story has two sides, not just the one that's always spewed at us about possibilities that you know we really never will get at that brass ring, but you'll be led to believe that you will. So. Um, thank you again for the opportunity, Professor Farias, you know, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And Professor O'Connor, I hope, I hope we can connect more. You guys want to talk to me individually, reach out to Professor Farias. She has all my contact information. I don't shy away from students. Many of those new students call me, I call them my little brothers and sisters, and they've graduated.